So today we're going to talk about some principles of leadership, and in this term, your physical prowess on the battlefield. Now, this is something that Richard the Lionheart possessed greatly. Now, we're going to cover a lot of things this series because a subscriber requested that I do a comparison between Salah Hadin and one between Richard the Lionheart. We already did one Salah Hadin, so now we're going to do one Richard the Lionheart. And one thing that he did indeed have was the reputation for being a fighter. Now, this can be a um, double-edged sword for you. This can be both a good thing and a bad thing when you're in a position of leadership. It is sometimes much easier to be a soldier and a great fighter than it is to be a leader and a great warrior. So that's what we're going to discuss today. Now, Richard the Lionheart, like I said before, he had the reputation, he was called the Lionheart for his bravery. As a matter of fact, he's technically Richard the First, and Richard the Second is actually named the Second because he's Richard the First. But the epitaph of Lion and the Lionheart stuck stuck with him more so than Richard the First did. So, um... Why is, it, why is this good? If you can look at other military commanders throughout history, such as Hannibal Barca, Alexander the Great, and I talk about the Sons of Tancred quite a few times, most of those guys led their uh, troops from the front every single time they went to battle, or very, as often as they could. Um, Alexander the Great actually received several wounds to his, person, to his body because of the several times he went in the front of the battlefield, and Hannibal also received a wound to his uh, thigh during the um, Siege of Saguntum, when they... Uh, slaughtered a lot of their enemies. So he was in the thick of the fighting. Now, why is this a good thing? Well, this is a good thing because when you're a military leader, when you send troops out to fight, especially in deadly and dangerous areas, um, the, the groups usually selected for that are a special group for combat. You know, special forces are not nothing new. They had special forces back then, and they have special forces now. Um, but they're usually exposed to a whole lot of danger during the mission. Um, a good example would be when Alexander the Great faced the 300 Persians at the, um, you know, basically the Persians last in the 300. He had a select group of men have to climb a cliff to come up behind the enemy. Now, the men who went on this group, they understood that if they fell off that cliff, they couldn't yell as they were falling to their death because that would have given away the position of their fellow comrades. And, you know, they did indeed. I don't know if they gagged their mouths just in case because, you know, you could probably yell out of instinct. But um, if I recall correctly, about 30 men did not make it to the top. So that means 30 men fell and they clearly didn't give away their position by yelling. So it requires, it requires a very good amount of discipline and patience before moving forward with that task. So when you are willing to subject yourself to that danger with your troops, they respect you more automatically. You can have people who don't like you, but they're going to respect you if you're telling them to get into a dangerous position, but you're willing to subject yourself to the same amount of danger. That's why it's a good thing. Um, the, the, the bad side of being a leader like that, of course, is the being subject to danger. Uh, leading from the front during any battle, whether it be medieval, ancient, or modern times, you're going to be in the front line, you're going to be exposed to the first amount of danger. So, you know, the arrows that are flying are obviously, you know, they're, they're targeting you. And also, if people know you're a leader who likes to lead from the front, I'm pretty positive any good commander would have special hit squads out waiting for you. Um, for instance, at the um, Battle of Evesham, uh, Edward I had a special hit squad find and kill Simon de Montfort. And they knew who he was because Simon de Montfort had a bit of a reputation for being a bit arrogant and he, carried his, um, he was carrying his own banner into battle. So everyone knew who Simon de Montfort was. So he was an easy target to find. So, you know, Richard the Lionheart would be an easy target to find on the battlefield. Now, good thing for him is not many people actually wanted to face off with him one on one. And as as you all know, famously he he did a one man stand against an entire army and scared Saladin's army from fighting him because they thought he was a madman trying to take them all on. However, that's the positive side. There are some negative instances that happened in Richard's life where leading from the front was not a good idea, or not necessarily not a good idea, but he made some other foolish decisions that led to led to led to being in a bad situation. One example would be uh, when he had when he rebelled against his father for the second or third time. Um, he actually chased William Marshall because William Marshall went and went on a raid and stole some of Richard's horses uh, during their conflict. He actually chased after chased after William Marshall, but he didn't put his armor on, so his horse was going faster because the horse was carrying less weight. William Marshall realizing, oh, he's not carrying he's not carrying any armor on his body, so he wheels his horse around, uh, killed. Richard's knight that was with him, and then knocked Richard off his horse, and he could have captured him if he wanted to, but um, for whatever reason he didn't. He killed his horse and had him walk back to the camp. Now, had he been fighting against Salah Hadin, Salah Hadin definitely would have captured Richard in this instance. He would not have let him go and just wander back to teach him a lesson or for some, you know, to prove some macho point about being the better man. 
he would have captured him. So there is that downside leading to the front. You are subjecting yourself to danger. That doesn't always mean you're not going to be, you're not going to come out of it. Like I said, other men from history who left in the front, Alexander the Great, Hannibal Barca, those guys did leave from the front and they received the proof of that. They, Alexander the Great got shot with an arrow uh, twice that we can um, know of. I know he was injured in his thigh at the Battle of Gagamella. Hannibal Barca, I mentioned the Siege of Saguntum, was injured. And then Richard, we know, in an instance before he even went on his crusade, was captured because not only was he leading from the front, but he also didn't put his body armor on, which is uh, <laughs> which eventually, of course, led to his downfall in the future. So that principle of leading from the front, it has its good sides and it has its bad sides. For everybody who made it to the end, I just want to point out that we're going to have some new series coming out. Like I said, first of all, we're going to do a comparison between Richard the Lionheart and Salah Hadin. We're going to finally conclude the uh, series between Normans versus Mongols. I've done some more research on that. I'm sorry if you guys have been missing the episodes on Wednesday. That's why we're doing Middle of Mondays instead. And we're also going to be doing one breaking down how the Normans evolved from basically the warlords they were and to the statesmen. You know, the change that took place, turning them from uh, men of fighting into men of an empire. Uh, Henry II is going to be brought up a lot in that because I feel he had a lot to do with that transition between the two. And um, we're also going to talk about Henry I in that series as well. So thanks for watching, guys. Have a good day.